Hi, welcome to this video. My name is Vince Ritchie, and I am a member of the Association of International Graduate Admissions Counselors. That's what I do. I'm an admissions counselor for graduate school. Uh, I've been doing this work since 2002, and my website is vinceprep.com, where you can learn more about my background. The purpose of this video today is to help you, the viewer, apply to Columbia Business School. And this is part of a series of videos that I'm doing this year, analyzing the essay questions and the entire application components for the top schools to which my clients apply. Uh, you can see my results on my website, vinceprep.com. Since I went independent as an admissions counselor and joined AGAC, as an independent counselor in 2007, I've had seven clients get admitted to Columbia Business School over the entire 10 years that I've been working, uh, including my initial five years where I worked for a larger company doing this graduate admissions work. I have had 15 people, 15 clients get admitted to Columbia Business School. So that's about one and a half per year uh, on average. Some, some years more, some years less. Last year, as I remember, there were three um, admitted clients uh, for Columbia, one of whom will be attending Columbia in the fall. Um, Columbia is a school that I am focusing on in this first video in this series because it's a great school to start with. There's a couple reasons for that. The first one is that among the schools that I'm covering in these videos, it's the only school that reviews applications on a rolling basis, which essentially means that your application arrives um, in the admissions office or through the internet these days, and it is processed immediately and they begin reading it as soon as they get to it. It, it, it. If you will, it joins a stack of applications and they are read in the order received. That's different from the other schools in this series, which are Harvard and Stanford and Wharton and MIT. Those schools wait until the deadline to begin reading any applications. Sometimes clients ask me, should I send my Harvard essay application materials, you know, two weeks before the deadline to show that I'm passionate and serious about the school? Usually I say no. It's great if a recommender gets her recommendation delivered early. The schools always appreciate that. But if you're still working on essays and all the application data forms, I think another week or two of time, things do improve with time. And so for any other school besides Columbia, keep working on it as much as you can before you submit it so that it really captures who you are and what you're trying to say. Columbia, on the other hand, uh, if it's ready, if it's anywhere near ready, look, nothing's perfect. And I, I tell this to my clients all the time as well. Um, it, it's a cliche, but, you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good, right? If you wait until something is... You're not going to get a 100 uh, score. You're not going to get a 100%, if you will, if, if, if there was a grade being given. You're not going to get a 100. Aim for a 95, is what, I, is what I always tell people. Writing is a creative process. And all the books behind me on my wall, um, or any movie that you would see, or any music that you would listen to, creative people, artists and writers like you, writing these application materials and essays, you're never satisfied. You're always your worst critic. And you might fret over one word or one comma until the very last second. And if you had two more weeks, you'd spend two more weeks on it. That's why we have deadlines. Um, Columbia, confusingly, doesn't have a strict deadline. There is an early round deadline in early October, but that, that doesn't mean you should send it in early October. If it's ready earlier than that and you're committed to Columbia, send it before the final day. Um, and it's a hard thing to get your head around, um, even though it's written pretty, pretty clearly on their website. I still have this conversation with clients often that say, and to tell them, um, no, in fact, Columbia does want it um, as soon as you're ready to send it. 
Um, starting with Columbia first shows them that you're serious. The other reason from the applicant's perspective, from your perspective as someone trying to write these materials, is that they give you more word counts and longer essays and uh, answers to questions, including recommendation questions, which your references, your reference writers have to create, produce. Longer is easier, shorter is harder. Again, if you've ever written anything that you've cared about, um, your first draft isn't very good and it's really too long. And then it takes multiple revisions to get it down to fit the word count. Columbia is pretty generous with their word counts compared to some of the other schools that I'm talking about in this video series. And so therefore, that's another reason why it makes um, Columbia a good first school to start. Um, the final two points here are that the, the essays for Columbia can often be used for other schools with modifications. You can't just copy and paste them entirely, but the story that you generate and the stories that you share, certainly the goals story, is required um, really by every other school except MIT, um, among the five that I'm talking about here in these videos. and. Harvard requires a goal story, a YMBA story, but Harvard's answer is 500 characters. That's about 100 words. Columbia, by contrast, gives you 500 words, which seems really generous. Um, and so you should use that space to your advantage. So use time to your advantage and use space to your advantage. Both, and for both of those reasons, Columbia is, as I've said, a good first school. Um, the rest of this video, I'll be going through the application materials for the school, and let me just share my main hypothesis about schools, which is that the, uh, the application materials are not created by accident. I believe from talking to admissions officers that a lot of thought and a lot of time goes into deciding what questions to ask and what questions not to ask. Um, Historically, I, I think Columbia is in the midst of a culture change. What I mean by that is Columbia Business School historically has been an ideal school for practitioners, professionals. Um, historically, you would say, for really for Wall Street, for finance, Columbia is desperately trying to diversify its appeal and also its image. And we'll talk a bit more about, more about that later. But it, it, and again, a lot of this is subjective. This is my view. Um, I lived near campus. I worked in Butler Library when I was considering attending Teachers College. There was a new education technology center, multi-million dollar, beautiful facility to help professors at Columbia University use technology in the classroom. And I was a founding, um, I was one of the first employees of this center. And I was help, I was creating and teaching workshops for Columbia professors. So I know the school pretty well. I know the culture of the school pretty well. The business school I visited, I haven't attended. I didn't go to business school at Columbia, but my sense of it from visiting and attending classes and talking to my clients uh, before they go and while they're there and after they graduate is that, you know, again, historically it was a school that gave you specialized skills, um, didn't really emphasize soft skills very much, and, um, was really emphasizing the advantage of New York City. They're still emphasizing the advantage of New York City, but they're really trying hard through master classes and executives and residents to broaden their appeal from just the finance industry for reasons that I think are pretty obvious. Um, all right, so let's move forward. Um, here's a summary of my Columbia tips, and then I'll be um, going through these in much more detail um, through the rest of this video. First of all, figure out your goals. Why do you need an MBA? This is a core story that you are going to need, again, for every other school to which you apply, with the exception of Columbia, that, uh, with the exception of MIT, um, that some of my clients do briefly touch on their goal in the, in the cover letter. I'll definitely cover MIT in full detail in, in that video and in, in that write-up on my website. But anyway, Columbia forces you because it's the first question they ask to figure your goals out. And the sooner you can figure out why you need this MBA degree in this admissions process, the better off you will be. My second tip is you should be researching why you want to go to Columbia now, but I don't encourage you to write that essay until closer to the actual deadline. And I'll explain that tip in more detail shortly. 
Um, next, my next tip, these are just summaries by the way, I'm going to be going into these in a lot more detail. You want to share a personal anecdote or personal story for SA2 that supports your goals. I'll explain why in a minute. Um, you basically want to show that you have the core character to make that goal happen. Um, you setting an ambitious but realistic goal. The personal story gives you an opportunity to, to prove that you have the, the guts or the character or the skills um, to carry out that goal. It's indirect because the personal story is not about work. But if, this, if the stories are well matched, I think the message can be very clear to the admissions office because they're professionals and they know how to read your messages and they also know how to read into your messages. So be careful that the messages are, in fact, the ones you want to send. Um, my next tip is try to avoid writing the optional essay. Um, I'll tell you why in a few moments. Basically, it's better not to have to answer it. Um, it's best not to copy and paste an essay from some other school, just throw it in for Columbia. They know, trust me. Um, they, they look at the questions for these other schools and they can tell when someone just sort of throws something in um, just for the heck of it. It, tells, it sends all the wrong messages. And I'll, I'll encourage you to avoid um, making that mistake. My last two points that I'll get into more detail, one involves the recommendations and the last one involves um, the interviews. Th that's my summary. Now I'm going to switch the video, uh, switch the view in this video a little bit because you're probably tired of looking at my bald head and my weird bookshelf. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to narrow these tips um, and then I'm, I'm going to overlay them not on my face but on uh, this chart that I made. This chart, which still needs a bit of work, um, it's, a, it's going through these five schools, Columbia, Harvard, Wharton, Stanford, MIT, and I've, I've created my own categories for um, tasks or materials, and you can see what those are listed here on the side. There are 12 of them, and then I've created these sort of fairly standard, I hope, symbol uh, system where if, if a circle is filled in black, it means that this item is very important. If it's filled in in a hollow circle, it means that it's less important. And if it's a triangle, it's, it's the least important of all to the school. And this, again, this is my subjective view as an admissions advisor with experience and results to back it up. So what I do over the course of these videos is I go column by column, school by school, and I compare what the schools are asking for, and then I explain why I think they're asking um, for those materials. Um, so let me stretch out the text a bit here so you can follow along as I go through this chart. Um, let me stretch it out a little bit less. All right, so the first thing, which is in my chart but not in my Word file, is that um, Columbia, like all of the schools, asks for application data forms. And application data forms are those little boxes that you fill out after you register for the school's um, application. And I encourage you to do that right away to get a sense of what they're asking for. Those little boxes really do matter. They reflect the school's admissions criteria and they reflect um, the school's culture and values. Also required for Columbia is a resume. I'll talk more about the resume down here where I go into um, some tips about the interview for Columbia where the interviewer only has a resume. Uh, YMBA and goals is required by Columbia and let's go back to Word and look at what I have to say about that as I say it. Um, Apologize here for the technical difficulties <laughs> as they jump around. All right, here we go. YMBA. So first of all, you have to explain in 200 characters, which is roughly 33 or 30 to 35 words, usually depending on word count, uh, how many, how long your words are. What is your immediate post MBA professional goal? And um, they give you some really helpful examples of possible responses, which come these come directly from their website. This is great. I think it's a very excellent exercise for you to have to express your idea in 30 uh, words, 200 characters, but I definitely don't encourage you to try to do this first. Instead, 
use the longer question, the 500 word question, which is why are you pursuing an MBA at this point in your career, right? And how the MBA helps you. That's much better uh, first attempt for you to express yourself because again, 500 words is certainly easier than 200 characters. Um, it's good to have space to explain and express your idea. Um, let me talk about my personal view, my professional view about what makes a good goal. Um, I have, a, I have a, a simple tip that I hope you won't misinterpret to be taken literally, but most goals, logically, to me, if I really think about them, that my clients usually write, break down into one of two core categories, CEO or entrepreneur. Let me explain this briefly. Um, and it, by the way, on my website, one of my most popular posts in my, in my blog and my website is my interpretation of the typical YMBA question and some very, very detailed uh, tips on how to write it. This video, I'm giving a brief snapshot um, of, of those tips. But what I mean by CEO versus entrepreneur, where can you have the greatest impact? Some of my clients are trying to make a vertical move. A vertical move means you're trying to move up, you move your way up in your current industry, okay? And by moving your way up in your current industry, you're trying, you, you believe that you can have the greatest impact by, um, by changing the practices in your current industry, by helping your industry adapt or deal with changes that are happening out in the world. Um, you basically want to be, you want to have power in your industry to make things happen and to make changes. You're not looking to the MBA to change your career. Entrepreneur is my catchword for a career changer. I don't literally mean every one of my clients says that he or she will start his own company. Some of them do, but that's a dodgy thing to say if you really don't mean it, if you don't have any evidence of entrepreneurial spirit. But I mean entrepreneur in, in the general sense of career changer. Again, is the greatest opportunity for you within your current industry moving up to have the ability to influence the lives of tens or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of employees and customers around the world? Are you trying to have that level of impact? Or are you trying to create a new industry or create a new company? Are the greatest opportunities, do the greatest opportunities lie at the intersection of existing industries? And therefore, do you try, do you really want to make a lateral move into a different industry following your entrepreneurial spirit or literally your entrepreneurial passion to start your own business someday? So goals, again, could break down into those two general categories. And if you want more tips and explanation, um, please do check out my website on that post. Um, but ultimately, you really want to express passion and clarity about where you think you can have the greatest impact in the world. All of these top schools are looking for people that want to make a big difference. The, again, it might be a big difference in a small uh, startup. It might be a big difference in a huge multinational. Or it might be leveraging the leadership training of these schools to have a big impact outside the business world, in the nonprofit sector, or in, uh, in, even in government. These MBA programs are trying to emphasize their, their role as leadership training uh, institutions as well. Let me talk about what I think constitutes a bad goal, or I think a narrow focused goal, or somehow missing the point. I see goals I say sometimes where when somebody's talking about why she wants an MBA, it's what I call the food court analogy, which is to say, I want an MBA because MBA, top MBA programs like Columbia are full of diverse and interesting people, and I want to be exposed to diverse and interesting ideas. There's nothing wrong with that logic, but don't keep it at that sort of superficial level of, I just want exotic. I just want to be, I want to, it's like, it, the metaphor is like a, a cruise ship. I want to touch every continent. I want to be on every shore and cross every ocean, or I want a food court. I want to taste food from around the world. It's fine to do that um, on vacation. MBA is not vacation. It's serious. The admissions officers, if you put yourselves in their shoes, um, it's about the intellectual capital. It's the power of the ideas that those diverse classmates have. So if you want to focus on diversity, I say focus on 
functional diversity. And if you watch that Columbia video, which I'll be talking about um, in, when I address essay 1B, um, it's, it does exactly that. The guy says, my study group has whatever it was, two finance people, two consultants, a nonprofit person, a marketing operations. That, it's the functional diversity that they're trying to sell. Um, and make sure you don't just repeat that, but actually connect that to your goals. Why do you need that? What kind of functionally diverse people do you want to learn with, and what do you hope to learn from them, and how does that help you achieve your goals? Okay? Um, let's talk now about Essay 1B. Um, this is the one where, you're, you, where Columbia is asking you to um, watch a video, read a very long speech, basically. The question is simple. Describe why you're interested in becoming part of the Columbia community. Everything else is just prompt and preamble and marketing, basically Columbia trying to sell you on their school. Um, my tip on this one is start networking now. All the Columbia students and, and alumni with whom you want to talk with, with whom you want to speak, guess what? Get in line, right? They're busy. They're successful. They're publicly available. They've made themselves publicly available through the Columbia website or LinkedIn or Facebook or somehow they're, they're putting themselves out there waving the flag of being Columbia Business School grads saying, contact me, ask me questions. Um, they get a lot of inquiries and don't contact them 24 hours before the deadline to confirm your fit with Columbia. If they reply, they'll be annoyed. Um, or they just will ignore you because they probably do get a lot of last-minute requests. So you don't have to visit. It's great if you can. Not everyone can, and the school doesn't require that you do, unlike Tuck, uh, right? Columbia doesn't insist that you fly to New York City. They realize that that's expensive. There may be visa issues, um, or you may just simply be too busy doing great work and making huge achievements that are going to help you get into school. But absolutely reach out. Reach out soon. And when you reach out, make sure that you have a value proposition to the person who's responding to you. Don't ask open-ended questions. What did you learn at Columbia? They're going to copy and paste the answer that they sent to the previous 10 people that asked that open and, and somewhat annoying question. Instead, make a pitch. I've been digging deep into Columbia. This is what I offer. I see that you're, the club that, that you're in or that you were a member of doesn't exactly have what I can bring. Do you see me as, do you think my idea is good? Do you think the students would appreciate and learn from and benefit from what I bring to the table? Um, dig deep, that kind of thing takes a while to think of. It takes a while to get a response to. Be polite, put yourself in the alumni shoes. You'll be there someday if this all goes well. Contact them soon, give them a early, give them a question to which they can give a clear answer. Um, and then you can use that answer in your essay, and no one else will have that content. Um, it's not just repeating the stuff that you'll see on that video or that you can read in any number of blogs. Dig deep, make real connections, um, but don't write this essay until you get all the data and all the feedback that you can possibly get. To quote uh, an author that's, who's been around a really long time, but it's a classic book about seven habits of effective people, Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Seek first to understand Colombia's culture deeply, then be understood by expressing how you fit that culture. Um, culture is complicated, and it takes a while to dig below the surface. So start the process now, but write the final essay closer to the deadline. Set that one aside as a piece of final writing, but put it to the top of your list for, as, a, as a piece of research. Um, the last thing I'll say about goals and the relationship between uh, goals and um, why this school, right, why MBA versus why Columbia, is I'll use a food metaphor of sushi. I live in Japan most of the year. Uh, I'm either in California or, or Japan all the time, back and forth. Um, my family is, is based here in Japan. My son is graduate is uh, enrolled in a local school. My wife's Japanese, and that's why I spend most of the year here. I work with clients around the world, but I live in Tokyo. I do like sushi. Um, not surprisingly, it's convenient that I am living here. 
Here's my sushi metaphor for the goal essay. Here's how it works, okay, folks? So it, uh, I'm talking not about the, the, the rolls. I'm talking about the nigiri sushi, right? A piece of rice with a piece of fish usually on top of it. Unless you're vegetarian, then it's something else. I'll use the metaphor of tuna. It's one of my favorite things to eat, even though tuna are rapidly disappearing, and that's very unfortunate, but it's so delicious I can't stop. you got rice on the bottom. You've got the tuna on top. YMBA and the goal is the rice. You don't go... The most famous sushi chef in Ginza is not famous for his rice. His rice is good. It's probably the, the best rice in Japan, the best rice money can buy, but you don't pay top dollar for that rice. You only notice the rice if something's wrong. It's undercooked or it's soft or something's wrong with the rice. It's, 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 it's off. You're paying top dollar for the sushi and the, for the fish and the presentation, okay? Why Colombia is that fish? It better be fresh. Don't recycle the fish. <laughs> Don't use the fish that the last guy used, right? Half-eaten fish, not going to look good, not going to get you in. So the rice is the goal. It's the foundation. It holds up the fish. The fish is the main, main attraction. Make sure it's fresh. Make sure it's original. Um, that's my sushi metaphor. And the very last thing I'm going to say about goals um, is relates to this handy chart that I have copied and pasted and modified from Poets and Quants. My metaphor here is that schools that are schools, it's the relationship between yield, which is over here in this column, and love. Love is why Columbia. Columbia says, why Columbia? And they want you to have 250 words of delicious tuna, if you will, about why Columbia, fresh, original stuff. Because let's look about, let's look here. Their yield isn't so great. Oh, well, it's, it's great. It's 72 is excellent. Tuck wishes it had a 72% yield. But it, it's not Harvard, right, which has the best yield of all, 84%. These are a few years old, but these numbers don't change radically year to year. Um, and again, much, much credit to Poets and Quants for putting this kind of information together from, from a variety of sources and letting people like me and people like you utilize it. Um, the yield is high at Harvard, not so high at Wharton and Columbia. Therefore, Columbia especially asks you to tell them why you want to go to Columbia. Harvard, on the other hand, can figure it out. They don't ask anywhere in their application why you want to go to Harvard. And they might ask you at your interview, but they don't care very much because they're pretty confident. Stanford's weird in this regard. They'd, they're the oddball, as one can expect. Um, much love to Stanford. I went there undergrad, but... They don't need the love, but they still want it, right? Their yield is second to Harvard, but they still say in their goal essay, which I'll talk about the Stanford essays in a bit, um, in a separate video, why Stanford? They still ask. I don't know why, frankly. Um, I guess because their yield is not 84%. It's only 80, and they lose people every year to Harvard. So that's why Stanford needs a little bit of love. It's relative to Harvard. Columbia and Wharton are relative to everyone else. And, and, MB, and MIT is also uh, doesn't quite fit this logic. They have the lowest yield of all, but they don't have a why MIT essay per se. You can talk about your fit with MIT in your cover letter and stay tuned to my, uh, tune in to my MIT video and MIT ana analysis for how to do that effectively. But this is the chart that proves my hypothesis that there's an inverse relationship between love and the school asking a question like, why do you want to come to this school? All right, let's move on. Essay two, describe a personal experience and how it has influenced who you are today. This essay should have a personal rather than a professional focus. This is a West Coast question. I've been doing this for 10 years. This is the kind of question that is usually asked by UCLA, Berkeley, Stanford. It's West Coast, but New York City is certainly on the East Coast. Why? Why is, why is Columbia asking you to share a personal, not a professional experience and how it's influenced you? Um, and, and let me just point out something else before I answer that challenging question. Columbia doesn't, there's a big gaping hole here. There's no symbol for accomplishment, leadership, or teamwork. Columbia doesn't 
ask you for a professional achievement or leadership example. I'll talk about how to deal with that in a little while. It, for now, let's talk about what kind of personal story is effective. Um, and also, let me answer my own question about why is Colombia asking a quote-unquote West Coast question. Colombia is asking a West Coast question because Colombia wants West Coast people. What do I mean? They want people who have good personalities. I grew up on the West Coast. I went to graduate school on the East Coast. My a, a, a big part of my family tree comes from the Midwest, and I worked in the South. So I tried to cover America before I left. <laughs> um, West Coast business culture, I know pretty well, having grown up there and having lots of friends who still live and work there, is anti-East Coast, which means it's a, it's a traditional conflict that you will find all over the world between old money establishment and new money entrepreneurial spirit, pioneering spirit. All the folks who moved to the West Coast from somewhere else, either other, elsewhere in America, the Midwest or the East or the South or wherever, or anywhere else in the world, anyone who moved to California, particularly where I grew up, or really anywhere al along the West Coast who wasn't there for 10,000 years, right, who wasn't native to the area, anyone who moved there, moved there for a reason, they were trying to get away from the old stuff and they were trying to make a fresh start, okay? That is deeply embedded in, in, in the spirit. California people really dislike East Coast arrogance and they can't help it. They need the banks, they need the funding, they need Washington, D.C. and the power of, of the East Coast. But they chose not to live on the East Coast for some reason. It's not just the weather, okay? It's also very much a spirit of pioneering, let's do new things. Um, that's why the West Coast is the West Coast. But again, why is Columbia stealing UCLA's question, okay? Columbia is stealing UCLA's historical question because they want people who can be effective outside of New York City, right? Outside of Wall Street. If you're narrowly focused on finance, guess what? Not a lot of jobs right, right now, right? A lot of layoffs at this moment in time. Hopefully it gets better soon. We're all hoping for a turnaround here. But they need people who want to come to Columbia and work in every industry, in every country. And to be able to be that kind of person who's effective across cultures, across functions, um, in teams, you do need to have a great personality and you do need to have great communication skills. And therefore, you better have an interesting story about your personal experience. Um, so that's my hypothesis as to why this change is happening. Um, uh, this video is getting long. I was going to share what I think um, is is a effective personal story. It's it's one that I have heavily modified from a client that I worked with a very long time ago who didn't go to Columbia, and so it's a it's a heavily modified story. But it's one that I always keep in my mind when I'm helping somebody craft a personal essay. But I'm not going to get into it in this video because I don't think you want to watch me ramble on here for an hour. I'm going to skip it. Uh, if you really want to know about it, I, I may put it up on my website or send me an email or something. I can talk to you about it. But I'm not going to go through it in this video in the interest of time, and I apologize for that. Um, a good personal essay in, does, I'll focus on this part anyway, does focus on or does give the implied connection to goals, and it gives the implied connection to leadership. In other words, a good personal story answers the question, why are you the way you are now? What in your life gave you your core values, your core personality, your core characteristics? Right? That's what a personal essay will do. But that's not all that it will do, because a clever admissions reader, and I think they're all pretty clever because they read for a living, um, will read through your message and be able to interpret the implied message that says, do you have what it takes to achieve those goals that you just told us about in the first essay, right? So it's a personal story, but it's more than just a personal story. Don't misinterpret my advice here, folks. 
Don't go for a professional story. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. They told you twice not to, and I'm telling you three times, don't. Um, do share a personal story. It is what they want, and they want it for a reason. Um, all right, let me keep moving forward. Um, my last thing that I'm going to say about these personal essays is that when you're brainstorming what story to tell, if you're working with me or by yourself or whoever whoever's supporting you in this process, or if you're just doing this all, God bless you, doing it on your own, which is great, share a story that you, well, list all the possible stories that you could use, all the personal life-changing events that have happened in your life. Talk to people, talk to family, talk to people who've known you since you were five or since you were born. Try to remember all those turning points and all those milestones and all those memorable moments in your life. And by the way, when I say moments or experiences, it doesn't have to be the day when something happened, right? The day I got into my dream college, which I think is a bad topic, by the way, or whatever, the day my team won the championship or whatever it is, or the, the first time that I whatever you did that changed your life, it could focus on that moment or it could focus on something that took place over a period of years, right? Experiences as you define it. Don't get confused that it has to be one, one day or one moment, but also don't let it be too vague. My childhood influenced me, yeah? And, you know, my parents influenced me. We could all say that. Try not to say something that others might say. Try to say something that only you can say. So talk to people. Generate a huge list of ideas. In the beginning, brainstorming, as you know from, from brainstorming in your, in your jobs or in school, wherever you are. Brainstorming at first, you don't throw anything away. Then you, it's a process of elimination. But all those things that you throw out could be useful. Right? It's like making soup, another metaphor. You know, you chop off the carrot tops, but the, once you clean them up, they, make, they add a lot to your broth if you're making you know, vegetable broth or chicken broth or whatever. So save those thrown away bits. You never know when they'll come in handy later. But to do that, you really need to think holistically. Um, the other point, the final, final point here is that keep your, keep your personal story positive. Some of my clients are sending me setback essays that they want to use for Columbia. And let me define, watch my Harvard video or read my Harvard or MIT tips for my exhaustive analysis of what a setback story is. But here's the Here's the essence, folks. A setback really involves damage, right? You're somewhat responsible or completely responsible. Somehow, something that you were involved with, a failure or a setback, hurt people. People lost time or money, which are often connected, or reputation or something. That Something bad happened and, you, and, and others suffered. There was damage. You suffered and other people suffered. Hopefully, nobody died, right? Hopefully you're still with us. Um, it, hopefully it wasn't a, a colossal error of judgment. Um, but anyway, you made a mistake. You learned from it. That's the key. But it wasn't such a quick recovery. Most of a setback story involves climbing out from that deep hole to which you have fallen or put yourself into. Um, these personal stories are mostly positive. You know, there are moments within a personal story. If you look, think of movies, right? Um, I don't know. I think a lot of the viewers in, of this video may not even have ever seen this movie. It was also a Broadway play. Billy Elliot, such a great story about a boy that wants to dance ballet. All the struggles and all the resistance, all the stereotypes that he has to overcome to, to cross that threshold and achieve that goal. It's not a setback movie. It's a, it's a positive story. But he, 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 like most heroes and hero journey type stories, he comes up against all kinds of obstacles, but he persists and he eventually succeeds. So it's a positive story, but it's a believable story because it isn't easy. What he's trying to do has never been done before in his small town. Um, so that's the difference between setback and achievement, or setback and, in this case, personal achievement or personal growth story. There are moments of difficulty in a, in, a, in a personal happy story. It's not all happy, otherwise it's not believable. Um, but a setback essay really is, is, is much, much heavier, and you don't just bounce back as quickly. But 
by, by, by bouncing back, you learn some very deep and valuable life lessons. That's the difference, folks. Um, last thing here, the letters of reference. And let me, let me hide my bald head again and get back to my, my graphic here as I move stuff around on my desktop to get this all set up for you. Um, I've recently changed my OS and I'm still getting used to it. Here we go. The letters of reference. Now, the Columbia letters of reference, this is, I think, a, another key insight that I want to share with you guys who are watching this video. And thanks, by the way, for sticking with me um, through this. I do like to talk. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I hope what I'm saying is helpful. And I, I appreciate it if you're still with me at this point. We're going to finish up soon here. Um, the, the, there is no accomplishment or leadership story. Does that mean that Columbia doesn't care uh, about accomplishments, leadership, and teamwork? Absolutely not. And, you, and here's my proof. The letters of reference, um, I've, I've chosen a few of the questions to emphasize on here to prove my, my hypothesis, to prove my point. They say, please give an example of how the applicant has demonstrated leadership. So leadership matters to them, folks. So this is where it's up to you to choose recommenders who can share great stories of leadership that you don't have space to share in your essays. And guess what, folks? The recommendations matter. And the, the admissions officers read them. And they read them carefully. So show good judgment, pick the right people to write the reference letter for you, and the right person is someone who can share a story that is vital in your application. Um, and, and support your recommenders. There's, I have lots of tips on my, uh, on my website about reference letters, about recommendations. Um, please take a look at those. I've got tips on how to pick a recommender, how to support a recommender. Um, but the point here is that the stories that only they can tell, in Columbia's case, are vital stories. Another, uh, a few other questions that I want to highlight that the recommenders will answer. If you're giving feedback to the applicant regarding his or her professional performance or personal effectiveness, in what areas would you suggest he or she work to improve? How can you improve? That's critical. That, to me, by the way, is the difference between a so-so reference letter and an excellent reference letter. A so-so reference letter gives a very bland and obvious answer that is essentially just repeating why you want an MBA, right? She should learn finance. You know, he's only worked with people from this functional background or this cultural background. He should have uh, an open, uh, he should open his eyes to see the world, blah, 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 blah. Not so interesting. They've read it, believe me, they've read it a thousand times. Help your recommender, talk to your recommender, dig out your old performance evaluations. Help your recommender think of something that is going to allow the admissions office to learn something new and valuable about your need to improve in some real area. I will have more analysis of reference letters in on my website. There's tons of stuff there, and I will be making a separate reference letter video, so stay tuned. If what I've said has confused you in any way, I will be happy to elaborate at a later time. Two more questions from the reference letter that convince me that Columbia does care about soft skills and teamwork. How does the applicant accept constructive criticism or handle conflicts? That's a great question, and again, I see, I see um, sometimes I get to see my clients' reference letters because the, uh, the writers might be sharing them. Um, and I'm also, by the way, happy to talk to your referees who write your reference letters um, about how they can help you. Um, please let me know if you're my client, <laughs> if, you're, if you're my client, if I could be of service um, in, in speaking to or corresponding with your the person who's going to be writing your references. Especially that's important if they don't speak good English, um, I'll speak slowly, or if they're just not, if you're not, if you're from a non-traditional background where the person who is most qualified to write one of your references has never written one before. 
Um, there is an art and a science and a skill to writing a great reference, and I, I have some tips that I'm happy to share with, with people who will write them. Um, finally, how effective are the applicant's interpersonal skills in the workplace? Ding, 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 ding. That's a great question, and that's a great clue, again, that Columbia is looking for those quote-unquote West Coast people because those quote-unquote West Coast people um, can be effective in, in, in a wide range of environments, not just in Wall Street settings. All right, so I've gone through uh, items one, two, three, four, five, I, uh, six. So I skip setback essay. They don't ask it. I talked about reference letters. Now I'm at item eight, additional optional essay or additional info. Columbia says an optional fourth essay will allow you to discuss any issues that do not fall within the purview of the required essays. Now some of you are going to read that and misinterpret it and say, oh great, they want me to paste my leadership story from Harvard here. No, they don't. If they wanted a professional example, they wouldn't have said, don't <laughs> they wouldn't have been so specific in essay two, or they would have asked three, uh, you know, they would have asked another required essay. If they really, really wanted that you to share an example of professional success, guess what? They know how to ask that kind of question because they used to ask it. Years ago when I started counseling, Columbia had the professional experience question. They got tired of it. Um, they got rid of it. They want your recommender to talk about it. They trust your recommender, maybe more than they trust you, to give them honest insights into your actual leadership ability, okay? So follow their instructions, also follow their implied messages. And I don't expect you to know the essay questions Columbia has asked for the last 10 years, but I know them, and you can find them by, by Googling around a bit. Um, trust me, they don't ask it for a reason. They don't want to hear it here. The only thing they do want to hear, they absolutely want to know why your grades were low, if there's a good reason, you had extenuating circumstances, you had to work full time, you were, you were a close family member was severely ill, um, whatever. You changed your majors two years in, you were too busy doing something else, you were doing varsity sports, whatever it was. It doesn't excuse it, but they want to know. They just at least want to know that there is some reason. You weren't just drinking a lot of beer or whatever. Um, during college. Uh, you, were, you were busy doing something and you were successful in some way even if it wasn't in the classroom. Is what, is what they'd like to know if that's true. Tell them that and explain it. They also do, they do want to know if you don't have a reference letter from a current supervisor. They want to know why. Trust me, my clients every year, I have clients that write this kind of short two or three sentence explanations. You can still get in, but they just want to know that you're cognizant of the fact that you're aware that they've requested a direct supervisor, you can't provide one, they just simply want to know why. That's all. It's not a big deal, but don't neglect to tell them the reason that it's not in your application package. If you have a criminal record, explain why. Um, if you've ever been suspended, they'll find out when they eventually get a copy of your official transcript. Explain that story. If, if there's something you must explain, do explain it. Um, otherwise, don't. I can tell you that the 15 people that I have helped um, for Columbia over the years did write optional essays if they had one of these reasons. They did not write optional essays for any other reason. They didn't, they didn't give five more reasons that they love Columbia because 250 words wasn't enough, right? Or they didn't explain the alternative goal that they might pursue if they don't pursue the goal that they explained in Essay 1A. Uh, or they don't explain, again, the leadership story that they think they're so proud of and that they shared with Harvard or Stanford or MIT or Wharton or some other school that they just really need the admissions office to know. That's a big mistake, folks. Don't do it. All right. Uh, supplemental information doesn't apply to Columbia. It only applies to MIT. I'll talk about that in my MIT analysis. Point 10, very important, and point 10 is the last point for Columbia, and that gets me to the end of this video, which is all about interviews. Interviews for Columbia are blind. A blind interview means that the interviewer only has your resume. That's what blind means. The interviews for Columbia are, 
as far as I've heard, and as I've been told by Columbia, they're only ever done by admissions. I'm, I'm sorry. They're only ever done by alumni. Don't listen to my words. Read the text on the screen. They're only ever done by alumni, as far as I've ever heard. They're always blind. And let me just point out, well, I'm, I'll skip that point. Uh, I, I could say more about this, but I really want to let you guys get back to your lives and whatever you were doing before you started watching my video. Um, here's my tip about the interview, and it, I'll keep it short. If given a choice, select an interviewer who is different from you, right? Your interviewer, if you're from finance, pick a consultant. If you're from consultant, consulting, pick a finance person or whatever the case may be. Because, as it says in that Columbia video right, which you should take a look at, the teams are valuable, the project teams, the study teams are valuable because they are deliberately cross-functional. There may be a couple finance people, a couple of consultants, a couple of people from every other category, right, every other background. If your interviewer is, if you're from consulting and your interviewer is from finance, they want you on their team because you are better at PowerPoint. No, that's a joke. They want you on their team because you've got something that they don't and vice versa. If your interviewer is from private equity and you're from private equity, you're simply not as valuable to them and they might actually judge you like they would... It, to them, it becomes more like a job interview at that point. They become very. They become a lot more critical about the deals you work on, or they're they're personally curious more than they should be about you know finding out what your company's up to because you're somehow competing with them. Actually, they're sitting across the table from you. They're asking themselves, "If I were a student again, do I want this person in my team?" Hopefully, the answer is yes, and hopefully, it's because not only your wonderful personality and your charming communication skill, but because you know things that will be valuable because you know things they don't know, in other words. Also, they're imagining you as someone that they're going to see at Columbia alumni events. When they see you across the room, are they going to gradually work their way over and shake your hand or slap you on the back and ask you how are the wife and kids or, you know, how's it going? Or are they going to slink away to the shrimp table and avoid you? <laughs> because you're annoying or because you're competing with them and and they don't like you for that reason unconsciously like a lot of this stuff's unconscious if you can if you're a man try to pick a woman if you're a woman try to pick a man it, it, i'm 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 going i'm going overboard here with this point but um trust me on this one it works it's the best advice i i, I can give you about the columbia interview all right i'm going to close this little chart I am going to put myself back on the screen and I'm going to wrap this baby up in just under an hour. Woo! What a marathon. Um, to conclude, start with your Columbia Essays first. Submit it, however, when it serves you best to do so. I'm not saying submit it first, but I am saying start it first for the reasons that I've outlined. Do explain your goals in MBA research your reasons to go to Columbia, but actually write that final essay at the end because it takes time to get it right, to make the top layer on the sushi fresh and delicious and unique and totally connected to your goals. Number three, when you're answering essay two, share a personal anecdote, a personal example that makes your goals believable. And again, this is indirect. This is subtle. This is not, you're not writing in essay two about your goals. I'm not saying that. I'm saying show that you have the personal qualities to make the goal happen. I will give a quick example here, which is the thing I skipped earlier. Let's say an applicant shares a story that gives a message that she is fearless. She talks about skiing and the first time she had to learn giant slalom because the, uh, her teammate injured herself and couldn't compete in the state championships. So she's, she's terrified to do it, but with support from her team and her trainers, she p places well enough in the giant slalom race that the team gets enough points to win the overall state championship, right? 
She doesn't come in first because she's slalom's not her event. But she steps up, she conquers her fear, she feels an incredible rush of joy and excitement for having conquered this seemingly impossible task. What does that have to do with her goal? Well, her goal is to become, uh, is to help the manufacturing industry in her country or in her region revitalize. They're getting killed with price competition from other countries. Her company and others like, like it in the manufacturing sector, which is where she's from and where she wants to stay. Um, or she could have been a consultant who wants to do something in a particular industry. My point is, she wants to do turnaround. She wants to help with competitiveness. And it certainly helps that she's someone with courage and, uh, and a fearless attitude who wants to be a top executive of, in this industry in her current function. right? So that's the implied message. That's what I'm talking about with the personal anecdote that supports the goals. It's not literal. It's it's uh, it's implied. It's subtle, but it's a, it's a clear message. And adcoms, believe me, are sophisticated enough to catch those messages. And I hope you can be sophisticated enough to include those kinds of messages in your application. Appl admissions is a science in some ways. It's data driven. It's also very much an art. And that's uh, it's an advantage that I think I have in this process because I, I come from a creative arts background as a stage actor, as an improviser, um, taking improv classes and, and doing stand-up in groups, collaborating in teams, uh, and also as a musician. Um, I have an artistic bent to my, to my personality, and I think those kinds of storytelling and soft skill kind of stuff really, really makes a big difference in this application process because admissions officers are busy and they're tired of reading the same old stuff that looks just like this last year's stuff, that's just like the stuff on all these blogs and chat boards. Um, tell your story. Tell a story that only you can tell. And it's art, and art takes time. Start early. Um, point five, avoid writing the optional essay, if at all possible. If you have to write it, keep it simple and concise. Point seven, select and support recommenders who will highlight your leadership in a professional setting because you can't. <laughs> You've been told not to. And point eight, finally, select an interviewer who is different from you. That's it. Eight points. 57 minutes. Thanks for, st thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sticking with us. Um, and uh, I think my next, my next video is going to be shorter, but... I hope this has been a good use of your time. And uh, leave me comments in the YouTube. Uh, if you're watching this in YouTube, leave a little comment. Like it if you like it. Hate it if you hate it. I'm going to be making more of these videos. I'm just getting started with this new aspect of my service. Ask me questions. Leave me feedback. Like me or don't like me. I really do appreciate the feedback. I'm always trying to grow. Look. I've never done this, the same thing for 10 years in my life. I've moved around a lot. I've done a lot of different things. And that makes me, I think, an effective counselor in this process. Um, and as a counselor who's sticking with this and loves this career as a way to, to use all of my skills to help you, the applicant, I am trying to constantly grow and improve and, and learn new ways of doing things. So please do leave some feedback if you found this valuable or if you can um, give me any tips to make the next one even better. And stay tuned, check out my website, and uh, I really do appreciate your time, and I wish you the very best in this process. Um, so have a good night or a good day, signing off wherever you are. Thanks again for watching. Bye-bye.